Is, is Hayden, is Hayden, Hayden always, put a moment. He's here to do this? I don't know. I'm not seeing Hayden, but I'm seeing his water bottle back there, so I don't think he's, I, I he's planning on other people doing it. You have to get him from upstairs. He was called upstairs for some reason. I didn't get the little your little thingy to work, so I'm going to advance it by hand. All right. Sounds good. Okay. What? Yes. Hopefully. They actually have something like that. Look up Sophia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was a trip. Check, check, check. Is it furniture? Testing one, two. Check, check, check. Because that's really, because it's little tools. Little too loud. I got rid of all my tools check, check, a long check. time ago. Testing one, two. Testing I, one, two. I was down two. to like, but I had two boxes check. of books left. They finally win. Check, check, check. Testing one, two. Check, check, check. Testing one, two. For me to look through two. all these slides, can you imagine how long this is going to take? Check, check, check. Testing Plus, one, I don't want to bring them here because of the human. So the thing is, if you did them in Kodachrome. Okay, Gary, can I get you to talk? Kodachrome's good. Ectochrome, it's gone. Ectochrome's gone. Check, check, Ectochrome check. Ectochrome doesn't survive. Yeah. But the Kodachrome really, really did survive quite well. I'm still, I mean, they look really good, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's like all the night stuff was Ectochrome, because it was faster. Yeah. Check, check, check. Testing one two. Now we, you know, we haven't been back. We've only been there. We haven't come brought anything back. But that would be very cool. I'd like to see what that looks like. Yeah. Okay. Are you gonna go? Oh, to 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 bring some back. Good idea. Without a person, right? That was all on that. Okay. On that that so was the long. Should you say? Uh, See if I can get it running over here. Yeah. Right. How long ago was that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, how are you? Did you get the email? Okay, good. Good, good. It, like, really fast? <laughs> well, that's not, that's, that's not going to, that's not going to be too good. That's funny. Is that right? Oh, that's too bad. Uh, yes. It's amazing some of this stuff, like the Voyager is Sunday still sending back information. From it's at the out at the very, the I think it's Saturday. at the Oort cloud or something like that, or past the Oort cloud. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, green yeah. bird. Yeah, it's amazing. And in those days, there weren't computers like we have today. I mean, it, I, it's it's amazing to think that they could do that, actually. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Wow. Totally amazing. Totally amazing. Really? Wow. Wow. Amazing.
Amazing. Amazing. I'm going to get some water, excuse me. I'm going to get a little water. And let, we're, we're gonna because of the 3D, we're gonna turn all the lights out except the one on me, okay? Okay. Uh, so that so it'll be more because the glasses take a lot of they take a lot of light away. Okay. Good. Thanks. Okay. I should have left things alone because you know what you're doing and I don't. Okay, yeah. So the sound was going too, too high? Oh. Get going? Cool. Cool. Make yourself a comfortable, relax, enjoy. Good luck with that project. Uh, yeah. Get the lights in the back, please. I thought I was going to be able to at least downsize. I didn't even. I didn't even get the downsize. All right. And and can we turn the, those spare? Great. Yep. Excellent. All right, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> thank you for joining us. Uh, I am Dr. J D Armstrong. I'm the Maui Technology Education and Outreach Specialist at the University of Hawaii Institute for Astronomy. One of the things I get to do as part of my job, they actually pay me to do this, how cool is that, is to put together these public talks and that means dragging uh, Gary and what? other great speakers. What just happened? Uh -oh. I don't know. <laughs> Technical difficulties, please stand by. Okay. There we go. So, so I get to bring these the speakers in and Today, Dr. Gary Greenberg uh, will be talking about sand grains in space in 3D. So, for those of you who are here, you probably have found these glasses on your seats, and those will be very useful. For those of you in the video audience, hopefully you got the message that you want to have these. If you're watching the video archive, take a minute, get a red, green, or red sand, uh, uh, magenta sand pair of sun uh, glasses to see the 3D. I think that'll help. All right, so let me introduce Dr. Gary Greenberg. Those of us around here probably, he doesn't need an introduction. His uh, PhD is in developmental biology from the University, Co from University College of London. He is the inventor of the 3D microscope. So this is, you know, he's the first one to do this. You're getting it from the original. He's the author of several books on sand, such as uh, this one. And if you're anything like my mother, you absolutely love these books. <laughs> she gets The minute he comes out with a new one, I know that what I am getting my mom for Christmas that year. Um, he's a TED Talk speaker, and he has a NASA grant to study moon sand in 3D, uh, collaborating with Dr. Joe Ritter, who many of you around here know as well. So let's give a nice welcome to Dr. Gary Greenberg. Thank you, Dr. J.D. I appreciate it. Now, these glasses, I'm going to give a talk in 3D. You don't need the glasses yet. I'll tell you when you need them. 
But what you can do to begin with is fold them in such a way that when you put them on, the left eye will be, will be the red eye. So otherwise, if you do it the other way around, then the stereo is reversed. So uh, to see the stereo right when we do this, you'll, you'll, you'll bend them in such a way that the left eye is the red eye. So we're going to see 3D in a couple of different ways. One way is the microscope that I use makes a rotational kind of little movie loop, and you can see 3D that way without any glasses, just by what's called motion parallax. And then at the end, we're going to have a red-green 3D little gallery display. So I'll tell you when to put them on then. So what I want to talk today about is one of my favorite subjects, which is sand. I really, you know, it's kind of crazy. I've been looking at sand for 15 years through a microscope. And it's still surprising and amazing. Each time I look at a new grain of sand, it's totally amazing. So we're going to look at sand from uh, uh, in space and sand from Maui to the moon in 3D. So the first sand in the universe was really created with the explosion of stars. The sand is everywhere. Sand is not only on beaches. Sand is um, in outer space. Sand is filled, the outer space is filled with sand. And they originally came from the explosion of stars. As stars evolved, the first stars just made hydrogen into helium. But as they, stellar evolution went on, heavier and heavier elements were made. And the explosion of these supernova started making some very interesting sorts of elements and molecules that started to come together as grains of sand. This is a little uh, explosion there, a supernova. And what happens now is, and especially in our early solar system, there was a lot of sand and rocks and pebbles, and they started to come together or accrete into uh, little planets and planetesimals and moons and so forth through the effect of gravity. But there's still a lot of sand out there, even after all of these little bodies have come together, and we see them as falling stars. So I'm sure we've all seen a falling star, and it looks like this really bright thing is you know, screaming through the air, but actually, they're almost always just little tiny grains of sand. I mean, really small grains of sand. But they're going at about 18,000 miles an hour, which makes the atmosphere glow. So actually, what you're seeing is the atmosphere glowing from this little tiny grain of sand, from what are called micrometeorites when they hit the atmosphere. Here's an example of a little tiny micrometeorite. This is really, really small through a microscope. And micrometeorites can come in different sizes. They can be made of metal, or they can be made of glass, or they can be um, made of, of uh, th 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 this here is, a, is, is sort of a magma of, of, uh, of rock that's come together, and it's melting as it's coming through the atmosphere. This is one that you can see that there was sort of some gas inside that expanded and made a bubble, and there's some other bubbles in there being made as it came through the atmosphere. In fact, you're going to see later that this is actually hollow when you see this in 3D. Now we're looking right down the middle of it, and the inside there we'll see in 3D a little bit later on. Again, this is just a tiny grain of sand. That's one that is um, made of a sort of a, of, of, of a crystal shape, and the crystal is melting from the heat of the entry in the atmosphere. So outer space is filled with sand from explosions of, of, of stars and from the collisions of bodies out in space. There's a lot of collisions going on, as you can imagine, through gravity. And that creates fragments of sand. But on Earth, sand's created much more slowly. And basically what happens on Earth is the mountains rise up and then they erode away. I know it sounds kind of crazy how a mountain can erode away, but for example, here we're looking at um, Yosemite. This all used to be underground. These were what are called plutons, and this is where the magma came up out of the earth, and this is under the ground, and it slowly cooled over very, very long periods of time, and then the dirt finally eroded away, or the softer material eroded away, exposing the granite rocks. So that's what, that's what uh, Yosemite looks like. And Yosemite erodes away slowly. These rocks erodes away by the action of water and ice and snow and freezing and thawing and wind and so forth. And finally, little tiny grains get liberated. Now, it's strange to think that a mountain can erode away uh, by water and atmosphere, but it actually can. So you see these Tetons, they're, they're eroding away uh, quite dramatically right now. If you look at a piece of 
you can see they've got these speckles in them. They're made of little smaller bits. And if you look with a microscope at a slice of rock, you can see they're actually made of little grains of minerals. And the little grains fit together. And they don't fit perfectly together. Some fit perfectly together, but there are spaces. So when the thing uh, expands and contracts by, for example, the forces of freezing and thawing, these little, these little grains can get liberated and they become grains of sand, and that's just about the size they are. So these grains of sand, this is grains of sand through a microscope, and they were once part of a parent rock that liberated these grains, these little uh, uh, grains one at a time uh, through the effects of erosion. And when they first are liberated, they're quite sharp in their, de in their, in their shape uh, because they take the mineral shape that they originally were formed. And uh, here's some Shabazite. You can see that has an interesting kind of box shape, kind of really square. But as time goes on and they erode away, they begin to round, round off. So the water carries them down, the wind... Um, makes them round off. If you've ever seen a tumbler, if you take a rock and put it into a tumbling machine, after a while it becomes smaller and rounder and very pretty and very glossy. And that's what happens to sand. That's why sand is so beautiful. It's continuously being tumbled. And as it moves farther down, over time it gets more and more rounded. And it eventually will become silt and eventually clay when it finally erodes away into really, really small bits. The harder the mineral, the longer it is to erode away. But to tell you how much, give you an idea of how much sand is formed on a daily basis on this Earth, uh, these are two shots uh, from a satellite, one of the Mississippi Delta and one of the Amazon Delta. This is hundreds of miles of sand coming out of these river deltas. And you think, well, that's a lot of sand coming out every day. And it's filling up the oceans, and it's, it's at the bottom of the ocean, and it goes onto the beaches. And you wonder, well, why doesn't the ocean eventually fill up? If this happens for thousands of years or millions of years, why doesn't the f ocean fill up with sand? Well, that's an interesting question. And the answer is, is because we live in a very dynamic Earth. It's always changing, this tectonic plate theory, this idea that the Earth is covered in these hard plates. The crust of the Earth is floating over magma over this hot lava, and these plates move slowly. They move about a centimeter a year. Uh, so if you look at something like South America and Africa, and you notice how they kind of perfectly look like they were once together, well, they were once together. About 250 million years ago, South Africa and, 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 and South America were together, and they've been moving apart about a centimeter a year, and after 250 million years, it's 3,000 miles. So the middle Atlantic Ocean is spreading. So what happens is, is there's subduction. In this case, you have the sand that is being formed is su subducted back into the earth. It gets recycled again and becomes magma again. It's part of the living planet or the dynamic planet that we live on. So we have some amazing sand here in Maui. And I've looked at sand from all over the, all over the universe, actually, not only the earth, all over the place. And, and not quite the whole universe, but I look at a lot of sand. And Maui has amazing different amounts, a variation of sand. So here's a red sand beach in Hana. And if you look at the sand from the red sand beach, it's really interesting. It's like got all these little holes in it that were caused by when it was heated, the, the, these little gas bubbles expanded and making this type of lava with little, little holes in it. Uh, there's a green sand beach, a solid green sand beach at the tip of, uh, of, the, of South Point on, on the big island of Hawaii. And it's a big outcrop, out, outcropping of olivine, which is a green mineral. And if you look at the sand from that beach, it's just, it's just solid green grains of full beautiful sand. And if, here's another example. And there's got some mixture of some little um, bits of the volcano here and here. Look at this grain of olivine here. This was just newly liberated from the rock because you can see the perfect crystal shape of the olivine crystal. After a short period of time, it begins to round off. Here it's quite rounded from the action of the surf. Now let's see. Let's hope this movie plays. Oh, no. Well, that's... 
that's a shame. So uh, these movies aren't playing. That's too bad. These are rotational movies, so we're going to have to see the 3D by... Um, hmm, that's strange. Anyway, we will see the 3D with the glasses a little later. So these are, these are, this is sand from uh, a Skeleton Beach in, in, in Namibia. Um, uh, this is, this is sand. These were movies. I'm sorry about this. But the, this is sand from, um, is that one going to play? No. That's, that, that's sand from, um, uh, in Greece. Uh, um, and there's some marble in there from some of the statues that he wrote it away. Oh, there, that one is playing. Here you go. Those others were supposed to do this to show you the 3D. So you can see the foreground from the background in 3D. You don't need your glasses for this. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute when you need your glasses. Now, most of the sand on the Earth, there are a lot of the sand on the Earth, especially continental sand, is made of quartz crystal. Well, that's one of the major constituents. And quartz crystal is really hard, so it lasts a lot longer before it gets eroded away into silt and clay. Um, this is very clear quartz crystal. There's nothing else mixed in it. When rock like um, uh, granite uh, um, uh, erodes away, it, 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 uh, you end up with quartz crystal and feldspar and a lot of other minerals. Those other minerals erode away fairly quickly. This really clear kind of perfect quartz crystal makes the best glass. It also makes computer chips that we all use. The computer chip that's in this, uh, the chip that's in this computer and slide projector and so forth is made from very, the silicon made from very uh, um, pure quartz crystal. And also sand is an important part of making concrete. So sand, you know, the glass, the concrete, and the computers all in this building are made of sand. So sand's pretty important. Some quartz crystal that it's now at the, was taken from the Valley of Fire, which is the desert near Las Vegas. But originally, or not originally, uh, Las Vegas, or the area in, around Las Vegas, used to be under the water. It, it, it used to be the ocean floor. So this was sedimentary. This was the sediment of the ocean floor. Then it raised up out of the ocean floor uh, several hundred million years ago and became uh, um, that kind of port sand. So now it's been aged. It's sedimentary sand. Um, you can go through cycles of this. Uh, um, of going um, over millions of years, quartz is so hard that it can last several cycles of going down to the bottom of the ocean floor, coming up as sandstone, eroding away again, and going back in the ocean floor. So this is quite an eroded version of sandstone. Now this is some sand from the uh, Colorado River at the Grand Canyon. So the, the, the Grand Can So this is collecting bits of sand from all of the strata along the whole cliff of the, of the Grand Canyon from all the millions of years of different strata, of different elements, sorry, different sorts of minerals. And you can see the wonderful mix of colors and minerals that are in the Colorado River at the Grand Canyon. Now sand that, are, that is near um, places like Hawaii that have, that have reefs and living and, and, and a very vibrant living reef beside the beach is then you end up with biological things in the sand. They're not just made of mineral. So a lot of the living things, uh, such as coral and, and sea urchin spines and teeth and bone, the hard, the hard materials of living organisms, after the organisms die, they leave behind the hard materials that become grains of sand. And they're some of the most intriguing and most beautiful grains of sand. So this is a picture of sand from uh, from McKenna Beach, McKenna Big Beach. You see a lot of shell fragments, and if you look in the middle as we zoom up a little bit, you begin to see some interesting things right in the middle that look a little different than other stuff, and these are the biological things. So right here we have a sea urchin spine, a little fragment of a sea urchin spine, and there's another fragment of a sea urchin spine over there, and there's a little tube worm down here. And look at this grain of sand here. This grain of sand is really interesting. It's like a tiny grain of sand, but you can see it's made of at least three different types of minerals that have been squeezed together by great pressure and temperature into a new metamorphic type of grain of sand. Uh, so looking at sea urchin spines, they're some of the most beautiful uh, 
grains of sand I've ever seen. These are little baby sea urchin spines. And when you see them end on, they look like mandalas. This is the base end where it connects to the sea urchin. And this is the tip of the spine. And here's, here's it looking sideways. And they're amazing structures. They're a single biological crystal. Uh, and they form very slowly. Uh, they crystallize from nucleation points. They make incredibly beautiful grains of sand. Now, right next to that beach that I just showed you, the McKenna Beach um, stuff, this is McKenna Point. And this is like a quarter of a mile away and has a completely different type of sand. This is mainly the mineral sands from the, from the outcropping of the, of the uh, right, at, right at McKenna Point that come from the, the last flow of, of, uh, of lava in that area. Here's some sand from um, Hamoa Beach in Hana. So when we walk on a beach, we're walking on thousands of years of biological and mineralogical, geological history. This is a, this is a, uh, um, a, a sponge spicule. It's the internal skeleton of a sponge, and it also brings light, like a fiber optic light guide. It brings light into the center of the sponge where symbiotic algae need light to, so they can um, uh, uh, photosynthesize. I never figured out what this is actually yet, but you have things like coral and bits of bits of the volcano and 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 bits of shell fragments and all kinds of incredibly interesting stuff. Now on l islands like in the Bahamas and so forth, where there's no real mountains, where <coughs> they have just islands that are quite flat, the beaches there are almost completely, or they are completely made of biological material: shell shell fragments, coral, bits of them. Here's a little little sponge spicule, little foraminifera, which are li were little protis, protis which I'll, I'll talk a little more about. There's a foraminifera. But the sand, when you look through the microscope at these places, they're just totally incredible. It's, it was, they were all living, living things at one time. And you see these little tiny, tiny, tiny perfect shells. They're really small. They're so small that they don't get broken. I mean, when I see these, these little itsy bitsy shells, with the microscope, they're almost always still intact, which is interesting. So we're looking at this thousands of times right now. So it's that that thing is really small. It's like you you if you looked with your naked eye, you would not know it was a, it was a shell. You wouldn't you would just see the tiniest of dots. So you would see no detail on it. Some sand comes from the shells of these little foraminifera. Uh, or forams that they're called, and uh, they were they were sort of an amoeba. Uh, um, uh, they're protozoa that when they die, they leave behind these incredible little houses that are totally amazing. And every and every one every type has a different. Geez, too bad the movies aren't playing. Sorry about that. Um, this is another type of foraminifera. Every every species has a different has a different design. They're totally totally amazing and beautiful, and they're tiny. These are some from Okinawa, the famous star sand from Okinawa. And look at this little tiny itsy bitsy shell right there, and the shell fragment up there. So when you look at every every sort of beach looks different. Uh, again, this was supposed to be a movie. I'm sorry about that. But um, these are foraminifera. There's another type of foraminifera there. These are the star sands of Okinawa. So people ask me, is that, you know, when, when, I, when, when you see these pictures, they ask, is that what sand really looks like? And my answer I is that uh, things aren't what they really look like. Things are what they look like depending on how you look at them. So, for example, this is a, some sand, and we're looking at it with reflected light. That is, the, the light is bouncing off the surface of the sand and up into the microscope. Now, here's the exact same sand looking with light coming through it. So now you're seeing what's transparent, what's translucent, what's opaque. You didn't get that information before. So as you sort of go back and forth, you can see it's the same, but it's different. You get different information, d different lighting. And you know when you see things in a different light, it really makes a difference. And here's another example. Here, here's an a, a even more dramatic example. These are a single, this is a grain of sand from the moon, from the Apollo 11 mission. This is with a light microscope, and you can see what's transparent and what's opaque, and 
the colors in it. This is the same exact thing with a scanning electron microscope. And that shows you the surface detail really, really well. And here's the exact same thing again with an X-ray microscope. And it shows you the inside of what's happening. So each type of way of looking at something gives you more information. That's what science is about. Science is about collecting information from many points of view and then trying to create a model of what's actually there. Now, <laughs> the next picture was going to be a rotating. Oh, that one's, yeah, there it goes. OK. So another thing is you can see things from different points of view. The back side may look very different than the front side. So our point of view is really important when it comes to understanding the universe around us. And we have to look at things from multiple points of view. That's the whole basis of science. I want to talk a little bit about the moon now. This is a moon is covered in sand, totally covered in sand and dust. And it was originally formed most probably through the collision of a proto-Earth, Earth before it was, while well, it was still sort of really, really young, with about a Mars-sized object. And what happened was, apparently, that a bunch of the crust, or most of the a lot of the crust of the Earth and the crust of this impacting object, um, was stripped off and went around the new Earth. So these two objects came together and made the Earth. And there was a whole bunch of stuff that went around the Earth that coalesced and it created to become the moon. Um, and so, as again, that wasn't a photograph, but it was an artist. Uh, there's lots of reasons why we think that's the case. The main reason is, is that when we went to uh, the moon uh, with the Apollo missions, First of all, we saw that the minerals on the moon are exactly the same as the minerals on the crust of the Earth. But more than that, the isotopes of the minerals and of, and of elements are exactly the same as the elements on Earth. Now, if you look at elements, you know, and, and uh, isotopes of elements, the isotopes means the number of neutrons that a particular element may have. May have. Um, if you look at it from a meteor meteorite or a different, or Mars or a different plant, they're all different. So the fact they have the same isotopes in the same composition means that they were once together in this, in this, yeah. Do they know where? It's a good question. I just, just did a, a paper just came out recently in science that said the mixing was really, really good. So it was hard to pinpoint a place because the mi mixing of the I uh, oxygen isotopes were so good, it really, it, it was really hard to find an actual place that, plus remember that the Earth is always changing. So since that time, it's remodeled itself many times over. So it's hard to say really where it was, but it certainly stripped off most of the, oh, so, okay, so the, uh, so sorry about the, uh, uh, the question. Um, so the question is, where might have this impact occurred? But it's hard to tell because the Earth has changed so much. But I want to show you something really interesting about the moon. If you look, this is the moon we know. This is the, this is the front moon. The moon is tidally locked with the Earth, so we only see one side. There's not a dark side. There's a far side and a near side. Both sides get light and dark cycles. But it's a tidally locked so that we all, it rotates at exactly the same amount that we that we spin so we always see the one side and the interesting thing is the back side of the moon looks totally different than the front side of the moon you notice the difference is first of all there's a ton of craters and secondly there's none of these dark areas what are called the the mare or the and what they are were gigantic lava flows now the earth or the, the moon used to have um fire fountain volcanoes about three point up to about 3.6 billion years ago and there, were, and there was uh, volcanic activity on the moon early in its development. And these were gigantic lava flows of basaltic rock. And it's only on the near side, not on the back side. So scientists are wondering, well, why is that? And when they measure it, it turns out the back side of the moon is much thicker than the front side of the moon. So it was thinner on the front side, and the lava was allowed to come through in its early days. So they think that maybe there were two moons that were formed early on from this debris of the collision. And when they came together, one of the moons, you know, slow, slowly sort of came together and became the back side of the moon, so it's much thicker on the back side than it is the front side. That's one theory. 
The backside of the moon first pictures were taken by the Russians, and then the Apollo program, uh, you know, when, when we did the Apollo landings, the first missions went around the moon. So, so pictures were taken then, but the Russians were the first were the first to get pictures of the backside of the moon. Japanese have done a, a very large uh, um, uh, atlas of the backside of the moon. Um, yeah. I think it's the theory that, it, that, that it's, it's, it's higher in elevation. It's higher in elevation if you look at the elevation of, 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 of the, so that's one way. But it's also the theory of, 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 the, of the not, you know, being as thick as the front side because the front side leaked this sort of stuff. But you can, you can check elevation of the moon like you check the elevation of a mountain. Mm. So when we first landed, we landed uh, Apollo 11 uh, on the Sea of Tranquility here, which is one of these basaltic outflows. So this is basalt rock like we have here in Maui. It's dark, you know, like you'd see on Haleakala Crater basaltic rocks. So a lot of the moon is made of that, but there's also highland rock as well. Now, an interesting thing, difference between the moon and the Earth can be really seen in two footprints. This on Earth lasts, you know, anywhere from one s 10 seconds to maybe, you know, I don't know, not very long. Uh, the footprints on the moon are still there. They have, not, they have not changed, unless that particular spot got hit by a meteorite, which could have happened, and then it would be totally gone. But for the most part, those footprints are still there, most of them. There's no wind to blow it away. There's no water to wash them away. And because of that, the sand on the moon looks really, really different than the sand on Earth. Now, this is what that stuff on the Sea of Tranquility looks like. It looks like, if you're looking far back, uh, this is not magnified very much, but there's a lot of basaltic rock. Uh, but if you start to look closer, you can see that there's other kinds of minerals in there that are really interesting and beautiful. So I'll just give you a little sort of um, tour of the kinds of things that you see. Now, one of the really interesting things that you see on the moon, which you don't see on the Earth, is there's holes in the middle of grains of sand. So that's a grain of sand magnified a couple thousand times, and yet there's a hole right in the middle of it. Not only is there a hole, but you can see it's kind of melted here, and it's kind of glass, and then that's stuck on, and you've got this thing stuck on. So what this was was a micrometeorite impact. Now, I'm talking about a tiny grain of dust going 20,000 miles an hour, the moon is continuously being impacted by these tiny, tiny micrometeorites. And they literally burn, they literally make holes in grains of sand and stitch it together into a new type of grain of sand called a ring agglutinate. And the, and the moon is filled with these things. And this you never see on Earth. So there's, there's tons of these things here um, on, on the moon. There, there you go. There's, you can see it in 3D. You can see the hole there and how this is in the foreground, and that's in the background. Uh, a lot of the sand that you see on the moon, uh, yeah, sorry, question? The, the, so the question is, th does the moon have an atmosphere or an exosphere? It does, it does have um, uh, in that, what it's an exosphere. In other words, what happens is the moon is always getting impacted by micrometeorites and meteorites, and that makes things gas off. So there is this little bit of gas there uh, of different sorts of, of, of chemicals, from the made mainly from things like impacts and things like the solar wind and, and high energy impacts. But for the most part, it's not an it's not an atmosphere that you and I are thinking of. There's not there's no wind or anything like that. These are little bits of detectable bits of gas that come out of the moon. There's a lot of glass on the moon. And the reason there's a lot of glass is because the moon, when you look at the moon, you see all these craters. It's, in, it's been impacted for, uh, for 4 billion years. So the entire surface of the moon is covered in sand and powder. In fact, when they landed, you notice when they landed the Apollo 11 mission, and they said, oh, this is a, you know, a giant step for mankind. Did you notice how far the step was down? They thought that the spaceship was going to sink deeper into this powder. But it turns out, because of the way the sand works, it's all interdigitates, and it's sharp, and it doesn't compress easily. So that first step was a giant step for man, physically, actually. And so all of these incredible impacts that are always happening are always creating these little balls of glass. So there's a lot of glass on the moon, because, as you know, heat 
you know, something hits something with 20,000 miles an hour, uh, the heat created makes glass, little balls of glass. So there's these little balls of glass everywhere in the moon, and and they go spinning around, and they can sort of, you know, uh, harden in the middle of a spin like this right here. Like a, the, and you see these on the moon where you see these dumbbell pieces of glass that it's been spinning around from the impact, and then it hardens in space before it falls. Because the things fall very slowly on the, you know, more slowly on the moon because of less gravity. Here's an example of one that was once a, you see a lot of that kind of stuff on the moon. And you see a lot of different kinds of glass. This is glass with a lot of um, uh, iron in it. Uh, uh, and there's iron oxide, the way they're red. And, um, and here's just a lot of mixtures of different colors of glass. Um, and what happens after impact after impact, the pieces of glass get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's really dangerous. The moon sand is one of the most dangerous things that people have to get over when they go to the moon. If you breathe it, it's incredibly dangerous. It's kind of like breathing, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, asbestos. Very bad for the lungs. It gets in all of the, all the little joints in the spacesuit. It gets in there, and it's like it, 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 one of the big problems to overcome is these little grains of, of moon sand. Um, this is from NASA. These were brought back. The sand that I photographed, these are all from the Apollo missions. They, 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 they brought back several kilos. No, the, they also dusted off their suits. Uh, in fact, I know that do Dr. Joe Ritter has took scotch tape, took tape to the suits, and because the suits are filled with the stuff, as you can imagine. But no, they brought back rocks and they brought back sand from each of the missions. And, and in the beginning, it was only a thought, you know, you know, we ought to bring some stuff back. But then they realized there's a lot of geology uh, to find out about the moon. So the, the other missions were planned specifically for the geology. Um, and, and so there were, uh, the places they went were to see what the geology and the uh, evolution of the moon was in terms of its mineralogy and so forth. So all that stuff was brought back. Probably, I, I don't know, maybe, you know, 100 kilos each time or maybe not that much, but a lot. Well, I forget how much. And um, a lot of it went missing. A lot of the first moon rocks and moon sand went missing. Now NASA is very tight about it. You're not allowed to have it. Um, if you put it on eBay, they'll come take, <laughs> they'll come take it from you. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's controlled by NASA totally now. And they don't give it to you. They loan it to you. So here's a grain of sand. Formed a grain of moon sand formed about 4 billion years ago. And the whole structure that crystal structure is still there. Now, I think we're going to go to 3D. Yeah, so now everybody put their glasses on and put the, put the red on the left. And now you're going to see the same grain of sand, but you're going to see it in 3D. So now, all of a sudden, you can see the, the crystal shape of this coming out at you, and this the whole crystal shape now becomes apparent. Whereas before, you really couldn't get a, an idea of what this actually looked like in 3D. So it shows you that you know, having two eyes and being able to see stereo gives more information. And that more information can be really important in science. So here's a bit of moon sand again. We saw this bit of moon sand earlier. We saw this same thing earlier. So again, this is another way of looking at it. So we saw it with three different microscopes. We saw it rotating, and now you can see it in stereo. And each of these ways of seeing things gives you more information about something. So these are some of the, uh, from the highlands, these are from, this, this is moon, so this is all moon sand we're looking at from different, from different uh, landings. Those last, la the first one's from Apollo 11. Here you can see there's green glass and there's, one thing you'll notice is that a lot of this stuff looks like stuff was squeezed together. Because first of all, the formation of the moon was from a gigantic impact. So the, a lot of the, a lot of the minerals are already shocked uh, and, 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 uh, a lot of them are brought together with great amount of, of, uh, of force. Here you can see in here, this is just an embedded, in the middle of this, there's an embedded piece of other material that all got squeezed together. This is all done, so it's difficult to photograph. I, the microscopes that I make, the problem with microscopes is, is you only see a tiny bit in focus. So if you looked at this thing with a microscope, 
you just see a little bit in focus and everything else would be out of focus. So what my microscope does is it, it m automatically moves the stage and takes maybe 20 or 30 or 40 pictures, all at different focus levels. And then I've written a computer program that gets rid of all the out of focus information, puts it into focus. Then once it's in focus, you have a stack of all in focus images that can be looked at in 3D or rotated, or you can look at this image stack in many different ways. So that's the technology that allows you to see this. A regular microscope, you can't, you can't see it. You don't see anything with a regular microscope. You need, to, you need to build up the image to be able to see it, what it actually looks like. Here's another example of a, with a hole in the middle. It looks like they're floating, but it turns out, you know, you put them on a piece of glass and it's black underneath. So it looks like it's floating in space. And in this case, I put some blue light, I put some blue, blue, blue light in the background. Uh, in other cases, it's black in the background. Yes. Question. We are actually, uh, my microscopes are too big to put on the space station. However, I'm involved in a project right now with H new photonics. We're, f we're flying uh, in 2018 with a, a little microscope, but it'll have my 3D software on it, so you'll be able to see this stuff in 3D like you're seeing it now. And we're looking at cancer cells and how cancer cells grow in zero gravity compared to gravitational situations. So we actually have putting this microscope in a centrifuge so we can actually create gravity or not have gravity and see the difference of how cancer cells grow with and without gra gravity. So we are going to the space station, but it'll be a miniature microscope. So here again, you can see really interesting. Look at these little balls of glass down here. Things have been put together this, from all these different sources because there's been so many collisions on the moon and so much compression of, 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 of um, heat and energy that these grains of sand are being formed and reformed. Look at this one here. Th that's gone through all sorts of metamorphoses. And the 3D really helps to see what's actually there. There's another example. Look at this little sort of band of mineral in the middle of some other minerals there. A lot of green glass. A lot of red glass. These things are tiny. If you looked at... These things are about one quarter the size of a period on a printed page. So they're small. You'd only see a dot. If you look at the eye, a tiny Well, there, when you, well, to me it's all precious, but, 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 uh, that, but the moon doesn't have the really, really heavier stuff. Or very, you wouldn't find gold. Or, you know, the moon, moon has mainly the cr stuff on the crust. Um, uh, oh, do, do you find stuff on? Oh, yeah, on Earth you find. Yeah. So if you were to look at sand from the American River, um, uh, in the second where they where they had gold mining, you, there'd be there'd, you'd see gold. You'd microscopic nuggets of gold, but they'd be microscopic. If you looked at sand, I showed you one earlier from Skeleton Beach. It's too bad it's the road. But in the middle of that picture was a little diamond, a tiny diamond. So, and th these, that particular place is where they do a lot of mineral, a lot of um, mining for precious minerals. So this beach, Skeleton Beach, is filled with grains of sand for precious minerals. It's totally amazing. Now here's an interesting, to show the example of, of, of sand that's been shocked. This is sand from the Trinity site. This is from the site of the atomic bomb test. And look what happened to it. So you see some of this kind of stuff on the moon. It's been really shocked and has bubbles in it and is like you can see the quartz has been completely shocked from this atomic bomb test. Now this is a meteorite. This is a glass, it's a polished front surface on a meteorite. And even on meteorites, you know, you think of them, oh this is one thing, but Meteorites are made of, of little grains of, 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 of different types of, of minerals, like you can see here. Yes, question. 
I have not I've not gotten to look at that yet. No. No. I still have there's still lots to look at. Now this is a Yende uh, a meteorite. Um we'll look a little closer in this area right here. And you can see the 3D really shows you interesting stuff. You can really see the shape and structure of stuff when you when you see it in 3D. These are these micrometeorites. We looked at this one. Uh, did we look at some of these earlier? We looked at one of this one earlier. But now you can see it. In th we looked at a couple of these earlier. That one up there and that one down there. But look what happens when you look close up at them. See, now you can see. Remember before I showed you this? Now, and I said, well, it's hollow. You can see inside. Well, you can't really appreciate that until you actually see it in 3D. And yeah, it is hollow. And you're looking down the middle of this thing. So it shows you the advantage of, 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 um, of three dimensions, being able to see the third dimension. It adds a whole other dimension to things. Yes. Absolutely, definitely. So one of my first, I, I have 20 patents on microscopes, and the first patents I ever got was to shine light from different angles. And by shining light from different angles, you increase the resolution, contrast, and depth of field, and create 3D. So shining light from different angles is really a big deal. Microscopes, when I, microscopes are still made this way. They have one light coming in one direction with a microscope. It's like a, a photographer would never shoot a scene that way. So I, came, I was a photographer before I became a scientist, so I started lighting microscopes like a photographer would light the microscope. And it turns out to be a way better way to do it, and you get a lot of advantages. And uh, but still, microscopes are lit in the ordinary way. Very strange, but there you go. Um, this is one of these foraminifera that I showed you earlier. You can see the 3D and how beautiful this thing was. It's just a little tiny grain of sand was once the house of a protozoa. That's an exoskeleton. Yeah, but it's really small. It's really, really small. And you find this in these little exoskeletons all over the place, in especially like in Maui on the Hawaiian Islands. Some great, really great ones. There's the, that star sand I showed you before. And these are, these are little, li these were once little tiny uh, protists. This is Okinawa sand. This, this star sand only comes from Okinawa. That's where these little guys live. There's my book. If any of you uh, uh, get, uh, are interested, you can get it either on my website at sandgrains.com or at amazon.com. It's got moon sand in there. It's an interesting book on sand. That's my second book on sand, as if one wasn't enough. Uh, I just want to remind you of the message of this talk is that each grain of sand is a jewel waiting to be discovered, much like the world we live in. And I think it was best said by... Uh, by William Blake, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. And I'll take some questions. Whoops. Where's the other one? There, there we go. Yes. Well, that's a really good question. So the question is, what is the definition of sand is and how does it differ from dirt? It depends who you ask that question to. Uh, but the real, the, the, the true answer to that question from my point of view is that sand is, is, is defined by its size. So anything from a couple of millimeters to a sixteenth of a millimeter, a particle, uh, it can be a particle of biological, it can be mineral, but if it's between a sixteenth of a millimeter and a couple of meters, millimeters, it's sand. If it's bigger, it's pebbles and then rocks. If it's smaller, it's, it's silt, gra gravel, silt, and clay. Clay is really small. So those are defining sizes. You know, sometimes I'll talk to geologists and they only consider sand to be quartz crystal. But that's a very, very... Uh, narrow definition of sand because if that's the definition of sand we have no sand on the Hawaiian Islands so I'm not going with that definition yes
this is a great idea. Who are we going to talk to about? So th the question is, can we put a, a microscope on the Mars lander? And this is a great idea. Now, I'm surprised that all the landers so far have not had microscopes. You know that? Which kind of blows my mind. You would have, you know, if I had been charged, I would have put a microscope on board. But there you go. Hopefully it will happen in the future. There is a lot of sand created by this. By this, uh, but yes, th there is sand in Hawaii that's created that way. Uh, so, so th yes, there is sand. There's also sand, for example, uh, in Hawaii where the parrotfish eat the coral. What they're actually eating is the symbiotic algae in the coral, and then they poop out the coral, and that becomes little nice grains of sand on the beach. Um, so, a lot of sand is that is that here in Hawaii. I don't, I don't. We could look it up, though. But I, I, I don't. I, I actually once knew the answer to that, but I'm afraid I've forgotten that. Yeah, we can look it up. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. So I, I'll, I'll give you, I could talk a long time about this. I'll try and give a short answer. The question is, any advice on writing patents? If, so a lot of people get ideas, and this is really good. It's good, great to get ideas. A lot of ideas never get developed because nobody ever decides to do anything with them. I'll give you a great, I, a great example of this. Are we late, by the way? I did. I did. Uh, so a great example of this is telescopes and microscopes. Lenses for glasses were invented in Italy about the year 1200, and people were wearing glasses. It wasn't until 1600 that they took two lenses together and started going like this. Now, that could have been done, for, that could have been done several hundred years earlier. All a telescope and a microscope is is taking the simplest one is taking two lenses in a tube and putting them together. Uh, I'm sure that, that people did that, but they never followed through to make the telescope and the microscope. Now, I know that people did it because I teach, <coughs> I teach young, uh, youngsters at Kamehameha schools, and I one day just brought a bunch of lenses there. What do you think they started doing? They started holding them up like this, right? But no, but it's, it's about follow through. It's about thinking, oh, this may be useful. This may be an idea that I could, quote, get a patent on. So to get a patent is, the first thing you have to do is get a good idea, understand what the crux of the idea is. In, in, in the parlance of patent terminology, it means what the claims are. What, is your, what are you claiming that's unique? So what a patent is, it's got to be two things, unique and not obvious. Now, the not obvious one is a very s slippery slope, and, and when you go have a patent prosecuted, and the, 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 the guy comes back and says, well, that was obvious. And you say, well, it was so obvious, why did nobody ever come up with it before? That's not always the best reason or best answer. So you have to say why it's not obvious. Uh, so the two things, it has, to be, it has to be unique and obvious, and it also has to be useful. So the first thing you do is you do a search on the Internet, and you see, has anybody done this before? And pretty much right away, you'll see probably somebody else has done it, but then you'll come across something and you'll say, gee, it doesn't look like anybody's done this. So then you start to go into a little deeper and you do a little drawing and you make a description and you, and you file what's called a provisional patent. And anybody can do this. You come up with your idea, you try to distill what the most important I point of your idea is into what eventually become the claims of the patent. Why it's unique. What makes this thing unique, different than anybody else has ever done? You write it and you send it to the patent office as a provisional patent. It costs about $50 or maybe $100. It's not expensive. You can do this yourself. It doesn't have to be on any special form. That gives you one year of time to write a patent on it, to write a proper patent. To write a proper patent, either you've got to go to school and learn how to do it or you have to hire a patent attorney to do it because they're done in a very sp special and specific way. And you have to do it in the parlance of, of, of that. And what you actually patent are the claims. 
first there's a description and how is it different than what's been done, but then it's specifically what do, what do I claim is different about this than other microscopes? And that's what it comes down, and it comes down to about ten thousand dollars approximately, or more. And if you want to go international, you're talking fifty thousand dollars. So it's not for the light of heart. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a big big deal. So uh, yeah. There was a little more. There's more depth here. Um, it's a good question. The question is, what is the depth perception issue? with uh, images through the microscope. Um, so when you look at the real world, the depth perception issue is how far apart your two eyes are. So you notice some people, their eyes are much farther apart. They get more stereo than people whose eyes are very close together. They get more depth perception, and they're used to it. The microscope, and the d I, I create the depth th through a, an algorithm. So I can make a little bit of stereo. I can make more stereo. So I kind of, you know, Choose something that that uh, is not so much that you can't handle, but you really perceive a whole other dimension. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Polarization is super cool, and and one of the most important, I think, applications of my microscope is geology, because you can put polarizing filters on on the microscope, cross-polarizing filters, and that allows you to see crystal structure that you could not see otherwise. Um, in fact, remember when I showed you the picture of rock that had been cut through and it was all these colors? Those are from polarizing filters. Those, those colors are created by polarizing filters. Uh, and what happens is polarized light, polarized light, you know, when, if, if, if a light is being shown at you, shined at you, there's there's light that's going this way, there's light that's going this way, all around 360 degrees. Polarizing filters cut out all the light except the light that's going in one direction. And, and what happens is, is if you take another polarizing filter that's in the opposite, so you have one that's making light go this way, you have another one that cuts out light that's going, you put them together, no light comes through. Except if there's an object in the middle that's called birefringent, which minerals are, it'll turn the polarization of light. And the amount it turns, it makes a different color. So when you see that rock light up, it tells you about the crystal structure of those crystals. And the color you get tells you about how much the polarized light gets rotated and what the mist and it tells you a lot about the nature of the, of the minerals. And you can see that all in 3D. And you can see the mineral boundaries and so forth. So this microscope is particularly good because it stacks all the images, and you see it all in 3D, and you can really get a, a sense of what, and you can rotate it in 3D and everything. You can identify the minerals in various, so the question is, can you identify the minerals? Um, and yes, you can identify the minerals through polarization to an extent, but the best way you can identify minerals today is what are called uh, Raman interferometric microscopes. So these are microscopes that you see by laser light, and the laser light that reflects off or passes through the specimen, the 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 uh, the wavelength uh, it gets changed slightly, depending on what the minerals are and what the atomic bonds are, and you end up with a like a uh, a graph, you know, and then you have a library that you compare this graph against all the minerals, and all of a sudden you see well that exactly matches up with olivine or that exactly matches up with quartz. And you can, without interfering, without uh, destroying the sample, just through bombarding light and looking at the spectrus, spectrum that comes back from it, you can tell exactly what minerals are there. They're very expensive microscopes. Microscopes today are not like, you know, you think of a microscope sort of, you know, the microscopes that we used in high school. And well, unfortunately, our kids are still using those microscopes in high school and college. but unbeknownst to uh, most people, there's this whole revolution in microscopes that's happened over the last 15 years because of the combination of robotics and lasers and computers. And that's allowed us to see things we've never been... We can see individual atoms. Individual atoms and how they come together now through microscopes. 
So, you know, we think of the, oh, the microscope is the icon of, the image we have of it is like, you know, Louis Pasteur's microscope, and we're still, our kids are still using that technology. So one of the things I'm trying to do is get modern three-dimensional microscopes into the classroom, which I think is really important to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very good.